Thank you for having me, me here tonight. It's great to be here to talk about the coast and the impacts of uh, climatic and environmental change, something that I'm definitely very passionate about myself. So when we're looking at climate change, when we're seeing the coast, when we're seeing erosion, this is what we're often faced with, a really classic image here in Collaroy, North Narrabeen Beach. And this came up as a big East Coast low storm, major media interest, and obviously major interest for the poor people who actually live at the base there. We've got our nice beach, we're cutting into what would have been old dune systems in that space there, and we have a bit of a seawall on the other side in there. If we actually take another look, looking back the other way, we can actually see that where that previous photo was taken was already another seawall. So we're actually seeing in this section is yes, there's definitely erosion, but we're starting to see an impact between what would say is unarmored and one where there's loose sediment available in this system. What are we doing when we see with landform change? What's natural and what's not natural? Because if you intervene at the wrong time, there will be knock on effects. And that's the critical part when we're looking at these landform systems. And what we're looking with beaches, and this is the important part, is we need to consider them both in a longshore and a crossshore in the space there. Beaches are loose piles of sand. And they're loose piles of sand which are exposed to incredibly high energy. And these beaches have maintained themselves for thousands of years, more or less the same position, but they're made of loose sand. We build a structure through here, we have problems, and these houses are less than 20 years old. We have systems here that are basically loose sand. That's the key to how they operate, is the fact that they're actually loose. They're there to actually absorb and adjust to the impact of the waves. So what do we see generally? What do we know generally happens with our beach systems when there's actual change? And we imagine our beach profile along this is what we call sort of an equilibrium beach. So our beach itself extends from right at the back all the way offshore down to what we know as wave depth, wave closure. So the closure depth is where waves can significantly stir the sand on the seabed. So what we see then when we get a higher sea level or a storm, and that's what happens during storms, is it's a temporary rise in sea level, is we see that we get deeper water depths, we get more wave energy, and when we increase water depth, we allow more wave energy to come in and hit what we call the beach face. And the beach's response is to then shift that sand. It absorbs that impact. So the beach responds through effectively flattening itself out. So if we look through here, we take that beach, we get some erosion in the space there, and that sand is then transferred offshore. The beach is effectively lying back and sh shallowing offshore to absorb the impact of waves. That's how it's responding to the increase in wave energy. The sand is moving both on and offshore as it goes. So as the waves tend to wane, you actually get them being more constructional. So it starts to get into the actual, the length of the waves or the wave period and their steepness. So the net movement of sediment will actually be in the shorter wave period you get during storms. It's generally tends to be more offshore. But as the, in calmer periods, the waves actually, the net sediment flux is actually pushing it back onshore. So that leads to a critical question then is, well, what are the timescales of this? So this is Maruya Beach in central southern New South Wales. Here's our beach face. We know that's a store of sand. Here's some dunes. Well, that's going to be a store of sand for the storms. How often does that go on? How does it come back? What's the time frame? So this is the survey data from this beach, just a selection of that. And each black line is one profile. But what it's actually defining is what we call a beach envelope. It's defining that volume of sand that's been used as we move the profile offshore. So to get an idea of the scale of this, if we just take this one down here, we're down about minus eight, five metres vertical movement on this profile. We go from, say, maybe take a line there, go back to about here. So 100 metres lateral movement on these beach profiles. So if we go back within this area, this is actually the storm scar from 1974. So all this sand here is our beach envelope. So what's the time frame of this? And the key part of this spot is 1974. We suddenly had the big storm events, we almost halved that beach. All that sand went offshore, and then it stayed in what's called an erosion dominated period, almost for about nine years. Then progressively came up about five years, turned back up in that space we're seeing our movement of our sand moving offshore, one big event, that's when our change occurs. But it then took about nine years for it to reach one stage and then another four year period, five, to get back up to normal for that sand to return. But it did return naturally, and that's the critical part. If any interventions had been done on this coastline, then there might've been a problem. This is what beaches do naturally. 
So we can then start looking at within another spot. So a case here, we're actually going to come along and then sort of return to another erosion problem at Inverloch. And what we've seen at Inverloch in the last 10 years is major erosion along the front. Big erosion area here, that sand's been gone and it's actually built out. So while we've eroded back probably about 50 metres on the open coast, this area here in some spots has built out hundreds of metres. We've simply here shifted the sand from one spot to another. All the sand that's eroded accounts for one sixth the volume of that entire spit that we're seeing there. Our sandy beaches are just this thin veneer, and the more I've looked at it, I mean, especially around Victorians once, there's actually not a lot of sand there. So you find a lot of the sand, once it gets out onto the mid-shelf region, it's lost. So it won't actually come back. So it really is just this little ribbon. It's almost like a river of sand coming through. Imagine there's a river coming down. We've got our water coming through the landscape. The sand's almost the same, just hugging the coastline and moving along is really what we're seeing. And of course, and that's a critical thing, where's the sand coming from? And the sand's coming from erosion. So when we see an eroding cliff, I mean, the 12 apostles, the beaches at the bottom are the product of the cliffs eroding down in a lot of cases. And that's where we see erosion in a lot of cases is actually good because it actually gives us the landforms we have. All the models, probably 75%, 80% of engineering models, assume what is called a classic Brunn rule response. So Brunn rules assume a completely sandy profile with a majority of sediment transport going from the beach face offshore. What's actually been suggested more recently, known as the Davidson Arnott model, was actually suggesting, well actually maybe some of the sand actually moves inland, especially in these situations where we're in a sediment limited setting, where what we'd say is has geological control. Not all that sand goes offshore. Beaches are loose piles of sand. They're going to adjust the best way they can to absorb that energy. So really effectively what I've sort of been trying to talk about is natural resilience. We have natural systems. They've existed under higher sea levels and under lower sea levels. The issue then becomes is really when human systems come on top of natural systems. And that is really when we start having to have policy interventions. And I think this is really important. And natural systems have variability. Erosion is not necessarily bad. Beaches are eroding because the sand is needed elsewhere. It's not lost. Erosion in one beach actually builds another one. And of course, climate change is then going to probably increase where that variability is. I think spatially what we're actually seeing. But at the same time, there's another hockey stick and that's world population trends. And of course, population is growing at an exponential rate. So even if climate was to cool, which it's not doing, uh, put that out, humans are growing into the current natural zone at a much greater rate. If we moved out of the current hazard zone, that would be a very positive. Coastal structures generally get larger and more magnificent. And often seen in a lot of spaces that you'll talk to people, talk to communities, and people go, oh, good, it's been fixed. I've fixed the erosion problem. So the seawall then often allows, then leads to this perception of safety. Well, we've fixed the erosion problem. Now I can build my house bigger. People want to remain on the coast, and there's really good reasons for it. And the thing is we're all very much sitting down in this Air. My house is my house, which is perfectly clear. This is my property boundary. They are fixed in time. And the problem is we've built those on a landscape which is not fixed. And is, we've built it in the current hazard zone in a lot of examples, but now the hazard zone's going to move. I mean, you can build a seawall, you can build an offshore reef, you can do lots of things in there, but effectively what you're protecting is the property boundary. The landform, if it survives, is a bonus. And I think in some cases, you've got to make that trade-off. This is back to Collaroy, North Narrabeen Beach. There's now a big, impressive seawall that's going in right now, where that's probably exactly where the pool used to be. The reason why there's a seawall going in is these houses were built on the dune, on that store of sand. Since 1974, there's been seawalls growing on individual property bases. The reason they eroded, the reason we had that big chunk, it was the last unprotected part of that beach. Storm came. One of the dune sand, it's not there. It just took the most convenient part, which was round the side. Sand has come back. That's what we're seeing in that space. But simply because there, we're on the active beach in the case there. The beach you walk, walk on is the store of sand for storms. The beach and the dune. That is the active part of that. And if we could just leave it alone, that would probably be quite all right. But as soon as we're on that, we're in that active zone. And I think that's, that, that's how I find myself as I've been studying this, is thinking they're loose piles of sand. I mean, that's a conceptual thing to think about. But the bit you walk on is actually a store for 
it's there for the next big wave event. That's what it's there for.